So this is supposed to be 35 minutes, and it's supposed to be something from both the books, one of which is on this Kindle. And I was just guessing what, what would be good. And of course, if you already have been in my lecture, this, you know, there'll be repetition. However, it's, <clears throat> however, that's life. Um, I love that. You do? Yes. Okay, <laughs> so this is in a chapter called A World of Services. So when I was trying to understand why everyone was so upset about women who sell sex, I had to, I read thousands and thousands and thousands of things, and I read all about the concept of services because it is often said that selling sex isn't a proper service. So I had to try to figure out, well, why, what's a service? Why are the maids and the domestic help and the nannies, why are they somewhere else? So I had gone through that and then I reached this point <clears throat> where I said most commentators view carers and domestics in the same light, and a few include people who sell sex, but many refuse strenuously on the grounds that selling sex can never be work. These arguments begin with a presumption as to what sex is supposed to be, the expression of love, for a particular partner. I am not going to, uh, there are many references to who said what, and I'm quoting sometimes. I'm leaving that out. <clears throat> so these are some quotes. It certainly signifies the nadir of human dignity if a woman surrenders her most intimate and most personal quality, which should be offered only on the basis of a genuine personal impulse, and also only with equal personal devotion on the part of the male. Next, sexual services, that is to say, sex and sexuality, are constitutive of the body. Sexuality and the body are, further, integrally con connected to conceptions of femininity and masculinity, and all these are constitutive of our individuality, our sense of self-identity. And then, Prostitution is disgusting because what you're doing is so intimate. It's different. It just is. For these critics, sexuality and the body are at the core of individuality, a given, needing no explanation. Karl Marx believed that prostitution was only the specific expression of the wage laborer's general condition in capitalism. And Friedrich Engels found that prostitution and marriage were the same except that the one involves piecework and the other permanent slavery. You got which was which, right? Yeah. <laughs> then I'm skipping. These subtleties rarely surface in the battle over how to define prostitution, a key field in the development of different kinds of feminism. In just the past 20 years, hundreds of academic and other research articles and books have centered on a single issue, whether selling sex can ever be acceptable, a job freely chosen, or must be conceived as violence and exploitation. Most publications can be read in terms of anti and pro stances. A number of recent works deliberately eschew a simplistic stance, but the nature of this conflict means that a stance seen as non-moralistic by one side is demonized as immoral by the other side. Research is often used as a weapon against those whose ideology differs, as researchers insist that their local results can be generalized to enormously different contexts. Research done on a small scale, but in different countries, may be titled Prostitution in Four Countries, or Five, or Nine. Nine exists, by the way. Research done with people who do not consider themselves victims, any argument that an individual may prefer to sell sex, and any absence of moral indignation are all interpreted as promoting the sex industry. Methodologies are frequently not described, including ethical questions such as how interviewers got to talk to people who sell sex, <clears throat> and many researchers do not appear to realize how stigmatized individuals may react to being questioned. The prestige of sponsoring institutions, such as Harvard, <laughs> is used to assert the definitive truth of research. These problems are endemic to social research in this field. 
Traditional analyses of prostitution also do not address the involvement of large numbers of migrants without civil rights in the place where they are working, which substantially complicates ideological discussions. And the next section is called Beyond Ideology. <clears throat> this part of this I read earlier, so shall I skip it? This is said, debates assume that an object of study exists and then I made a long list of all the different kinds of jobs that can be considered sex industry jobs. Do you want to hear them again? We heard them, you heard them earlier. This sure. was, you want to hear them again? Because they're quite they're funny. They're jolly. They're very jolly. <laughs> it is, it's hilarious. Um, to perpetuate the prostitution debate, participants must ignore a wide variety of activities constituting the sex industry, which occur in different cultural, economic, geographic, and social contexts. <clears throat> Services include manual, oral, and penetrative stimulation of genitals and other body parts, massage, erotic conversation in person by telephone or via the internet, dance on st stages, tables between viewers' legs, watched on websites or in peep shows, and variously called strip tease, lap dancing, pole dancing, table dancing, and exotic dance. Bondage and domination that may include spanking, whipping, cross-dressing, and other fetishes with clients either dominant or submissive, sexual healing and therapy, attentive com a company at dinners and events, nude services like table waiting and telegram delivery, and acting in sexual cinema and videos. The industry also includes the sale of sex toys, clothes and gear, erotic literature, videos, and DVDs. Despite some commentators' confidence that normality and abnormality can be defined, it is impossible to draw a line between all the above-mentioned commercial services and those that provide spaces for partner swapping, swinging and polyamory, or those devoted to health and well-being, where sex may be opportunistically sold. Moreover, the sale of sex aids has a long history. Virility potions, aphrodisiacs, contraceptive devices, even before the modern medical industry began to define dysfunctions and to prescribe therapies that may involve paid surrogate sexual partners. Queer theory questions the idea that one kind of sex or sexuality is more natural than others. Those who oppose prostitution believe that a good, healthy, full sexual relationship must proceed along a prescribed route and that financial payment ruins everything, making true intimacy out of the question. Research on sexual desire shows, however, that, and this is Eve Sedgwick, for some people, it is important that sex be embedded in contexts resonant with meaning, narrative, and connectedness with other aspects of their life. For other people, it is important that they not be. <laughs> to others, it doesn't occur that they might be. It's <laughs> waiting for God, though, isn't it? That's okay. um, many commentators believe that diverse services encourage the fantasy of sensuous reciprocity are replacing traditional street prostitution. Such a change can be called the commercialization or commodification of intimacy and posed as wholly negative, or it can be viewed as more normal. These are quotes. The retailing of intimacy is a common feature of modern life and of other paid work like therapy and massage, where equality and reciprocity are not usually features of the professional relationship. The variable among the listening occupations is the degree to which a client may assume that the service provider is genuinely concerned about the client or the intimate revelations the client has unilaterally offered. The psychotherapist, explicitly seen as a caregiver, is assumed to care the most, while the barber <laughs> bartender and non-sexual masseurs are expected to care the least. Expectations about the call girls caring probably lie in the middle ground. So you realize that these are all these people theorizing. This has just been going on now for decades, people trying to explain what this is all about. This normalizing logic offends those who deplore all sexual acts that are paid for. 
the two perceptions that sex is incom incomparable to anything else and that it is comparable are so fundamental and so opposed that alone they explain why the traditional debate has lasted so long. But those who sell sex themselves reveal that their jobs are far from being just sex. Quotations. I only went upstairs with three or four. I couldn't do more. It was hard for me, not like for other women who did 10. The truth is I worked more with drinks because I like talking with people. And there, a lot of people go to talk with you. You become a bit of a psychologist for them. For me, it worked well to talk with people. I like that a lot. <clears throat> when we go out and eat, the customer tries to pretend he's a man of the world. They try to make interesting conversation, but they can't manage. They're incredibly boring. <laughs> My role is to cast a glow over them so the older men look like they're, not, they're out with an attractive woman who looks expensive. <clears throat> These were mostly uh, Latin American women and Eastern European women that I talked to. When you're simpatica, it's not because you want to be, it's to earn money. There's always a lie. You have to maintain the lie, maintain the illusion. It's like a game of cat and mouse. You have to provoke illusions. <clears throat> What, what I try to do is get the client to invite me to his table, get into conversation in order to make friends, and so he doesn't feel he is paying, and I don't feel he is paying me. I have regular clients who are rich, who buy me champagne that costs 250 or 300 euros a bottle. You try to make it last, and then you don't have to be with so many people. Men who sell to women also sell more than sex. The street guides present themselves as friends, as someone who wants to help. As street guides told me over and over again, their foremost aim is to make tourists senang, happy. If the tourist is happy, then he or she is in the mood of spending, as do men who sell to men. Yes, of course I give a boy money or buy him clothes or something like that, but that doesn't mean he's a prostitute. There's just no affection like there is in Prague where the boy really wants to be with you and where you can have much more than just a one night stand. I have to say, I still find all of these incredibly interesting and funny. That's why I'm laughing. <laughs> I, <laughs> it, yeah, it's just mind blowing. Sex service discourse is not so different from discourses on housework and caring, all trying to define tasks that can be bought and sold as well as assert a special human touch. Paid activities may include the production of feelings of intimacy and reciprocity, whether the individuals involved intend them or not, and despite the fact that overall structures are patriarchal and unjust. The ability to maintain emotional distance is an aspect of the work that some workers master and some do not. Hochschild, or however you like to say her name, explains the concept of emotional labor in her study of flight attendants, arguing that their ability to handle the job is determined by control over the conditions and terms of the exploitation of their emotional resources. Sex workers often perform their own sexual arousal and orgasms for clients who feel more excited and gratified if they believe that workers are. They also act out flirting, counseling, and diplomacy, but there is no reason to limit such faking to those selling sex. Babysitters and carers of grannies may also pretend to care by smiling on demand, listening to boring stories, or doling out caresses without feeling affection. Now I'm skipping. <clears throat> some find selling sex more enjoyable than other jobs. So now we have some quotes. I know I should get out of this business, but I don't know if I would like any other job as much. In the bar, I spend my time dancing, drinking, and talking. The stuff I did in minimum wage service industry work, this is where I can draw the most comparisons, and this is where I can see why sex work is so much more preferable. The things I like least about clients, you can see in bosses who don't respect you in the service sector. At least in sex work, you're there for only an hour and you're being paid as much as you'd make in a week at McDonald's. <clears throat> for me, this is not really work, like in a factory or store. I like living here in Makati and working in the bar. 
Sometimes the customer will take me to a nice restaurant or disco. I also go on vacation with customers sometimes, and we stay in nice hotels. Although much discourse treats those who sell sex as damaged, drugged, or incapable of handling emotional relationships, the flexible schedules and independence of the work are attractive to and empower many. These are some more, these are migrants. <clears throat> One day I met a friend of mine while I was walking in the town center. I learned that she was a prostitute so her children could live in a decent way. This work has the advantage of financial ease and freedom to work schedules that allow spending more time with the children. This was a French woman of Algerian par parents in France. At the beginning, he was giving me a lot of money, but later on, he started to perceive me as his living partner. His family and his friends know me and accept me, but I don't want to marry him, although I love him. I'm afraid that if I marry him, our love will disappear. He won't value me anymore he will try to restrict my freedom. So I started to go into the suitcase industry and also to work as a sex worker. That's a Kazakh woman in Turkey. In a way, you can't say you like it 100%, but you can't say you don't like it either, because it's interesting. Also, you meet a lot of people. Whether you like it or not, clients are of all kinds. This was a Colombian woman in Spain. For many, it is obvious that selling sex is a job, not like any other, but still a feasible occupation. About the sex itself, many say they don't feel anything when they are with clients, while others feel disgust, fear, loneliness, sadness, or a sense of sin. Quote, we go to mass at least once a week, but we can't take communion because we do this work. We can't because we are committing adultery, because we do it with married men. But people also mention feeling disgust and sadness in their jobs cleaning bathrooms or bodies, and they experience emotional dangers when living in houses and taking care of children not their own. At the same time, there are those who enjoy the sex and sex work at least some of the time. Finally, there are emotional pitfalls for those who buy services as well. Clients fall in love with professionals, whether sex workers or carers. Once we replace the concept prostitution with commercial sex, debates about whether it can ever be a job seem irrelevant. As for whether these activities are services or not, if they are not, what are they? To give them no name means erasing them and all the people doing them, whether to survive, get ahead, become wealthy, or support other people, as well as eliminating all the non-sexual support and management services implicated in the industry. In the end, it is only possible to isolate sexual services from other services if sexual communication and touching are accepted as utterly different from all other contact. This isolation also requires us to accept that the only thing that happens in a sexual service is sex, reducing the relationship to physical contact between specific points of the body and pretending that nothing else happens. <coughs> What time is it? How, how long did that take? You have 20 minutes left. I have 20 minutes left. Um, I'm going to take this now, just in case. So what am I pressing first to get on? I've got the screen saver, right? So after all these years, and my feelings that things were not really advancing very much. Thank you. It's going to be this one. Okay, I think I remember. Um, I, and the fact that one repeats things all the time, I decided that I wanted to tell all the other millions of stories and interesting things that I know. My favorite parts are always the voices of the people I talk to without, I mean, I wouldn't have done it without that. Um, and so that's why I decided um, it's, a, it's a series of mystery novels. So I took a, a set genre that has some conventions, and so there's a detective, and then there are people that she's trying to find, um, and published it myself so that I wouldn't be fighting with anybody about what you're supposed to say. And, um, so it's called The Three-Headed Dog. The Three-Headed Dog 
in Greek mythology guards the entrance to Hades. I won't go into long anyway. So this is definitely my negative view of migration policy and what it's like. So, so that these are people, these are these undocumented migrants who are arriving in Spain, having been smuggled, getting into trouble, having no rights in Spain, and simply trying to move forward and move ahead. But in my view, they are negotiating this entrance with police, Interpol, yeah, helicopters. They're now looking for people. You know, they've got airplanes out in the Mediterranean trying to find the boats. Yeah, it's pretty horrendous. Um, so the main character is a, a migrant herself, uh, Felix. She's from Argentina. And she, at one point, talks a little about her own experience. Eventually, I gave up and crossed the ocean again to wander about Europe, rebellious and sometimes, when I worked in the black economy, a miscreant. But how else could I keep traveling? Some of the jobs I had were unpleasant, and a couple of times I had to make a getaway from folks who wanted me off their territory. I remember once crouching under a table after shots were fired through the window in an Italian town. So when everyone says I know how it works, they are right. At this point, I appear more sedate, but my ideas about people coming over and being almost permanently on the lam were formed a long time ago. The jobs include scrubbing floors, peddling knockoff designer bags or pirated movies and music on CDs, harvesting vegetables under plastic, carrying sacks up precarious scaffolding, staying up all night with other women's babies, feeding the complaining elderly, washing dishes and selling sex. They get underpaid, underpaid pawed, beaten and humiliated and have no job security. People maltreat them, and when they are rescued from bad situations, they are probably deported. But also they accept escape destinies they saw as rotten. See a bit of the world, learn new trades, have lives, send money home. Most try to adapt and contribute something of themselves. Doesn't it bother you they go into debt to smugglers to get them across borders only to work unconscionable hours in feudal conditions? Marcelo once asked me during an evening at the dog. That's the bar. It's also the name of the bar. Sure, it bothers me, but I don't think it would be better to make everyone stay home and be miserable. News of available jobs reaches everywhere, and plenty of people think it worthwhile to try to get them. They can't do it the kosher way, so middlemen are indispensable. <clears throat> My cousin does it, and he's an okay guy and not rich, someone said. It's a business, the jobs are there. But it's all illegal, the law is worth something, isn't it? The laws aren't good for everyone. For many, the only way to get anywhere is to find a gap to slip through. We're talking about people with bad luck and bad connections. Sola often speaks up for the upside down world. Everyone can't be in the mainstream or it wouldn't be Maine anymore, right? And then what would the politicians do? They went on to the hypocrisy of local politics. No, of course you like that. Right. And then this is a later chapter. I don't actually have one of these. <laughs> so I've just learned how to do this minor thing. Um, one of the characters is one, like, her name is Marina, and she belongs to this Dominican tradition that I talked about in my talk. So these are strong women, uneducated, not un, they're from the countryside in Dominicana, um, but there are now generations of women who have traveled to Europe to sell sex and sent money home and built houses, and their children have gone, and. Some of it is cyclical. She belongs to one of these families. But in the plot of the dog, the smuggler makes a big error and she ends up on her own. So she's in Madrid and she needs to get to Malaga where she has a contract waiting for her to work in a club. 
Marina waited one more day in Carabanchel before realizing it was no use. First, Eddie never came back, and then Cesar's phone number died. Maybe he switched phones. Maybe he would someday show up. But she no longer believed he could do anything for her. By now, he would have spent money to get her off his back if he could, so she had to conclude he was broke. The job on the coast would not wait much longer. There were too many girls available, and there was no response from her friend in Malaga. It was make or break time. The ride south from Madrid was long, but the bus was warm and she began to relax. It was always better once you took charge yourself instead of being frustrated and annoyed at other people's fuck-ups. It had been drilled into her from childhood. She came from a long line of women who confront what fate brings without whimpering, making do with crappy options and an unfair system. This was out in the island backwoods where there were few prospects and no money. From the bus window, the dry brown and yellow grass stretched out on, out on endlessly, making her long for the sweet-smelling island greenery. No wonder the conquistadores thought they had reached paradise if this was what they knew. But then if nice trees and flowers were enough to live on, she would never have left home. She would have made do with slaving away as, as a shop assistant in her aunt's colmado or as a maid to some pretentious lady in the city, either way for pennies. Instead, she took a job as a hostess in a beer hall, and her mother sobbed like it was the end of the world. It was okay for a while, but Marina was always looking to better herself. She got taken on at an open-air nightclub in a larger town. It had 20 rickety tables, strings of colored lights, and loud music equipment. There was a platform made of two-by-fours, where a single spot was turned on women dancing naked. It was close enough to beaches that tourists rode up on flimsy motoconchos, guys of all different nationalities, some who could barely stay on the bike. Motos with five Dominican kids would pass them roaring with laughter. Marina learned which men danced the best, which were most polite, and which gave the biggest tips. The craziest thing was the lines they spun. Come with me to Berlin, you'll be a queen. There's no one like you in my hometown. You're a real woman like we don't have anymore. What a beautiful color your skin is. Foreigners called island girls sweet and willing to do anything they were asked. She fell for it only once, but the Romeo gave away his plan when he let slip how nice she would be able to make his apartment. If she wanted to be someone's wife, she could have stayed at home. When she was growing up, everyone told stories about how to travel abroad. There were television shows, websites, priests and ladies, all talking about the dangers. So there was no claim she had not heard. France, the cost of living is sky high and they spit on you for speaking their language wrong. Switzerland, it's always freezing. My cousin almost died waiting for a bus. No one would give him a lift. In Amsterdam, everything is legal. You can smoke as much weed as you want. If you wanted real information, you listened to locals who came back for visits after setting up somewhere overseas. The town where she got the dancing job was a marketplace for trips. At first, the information seemed contradictory, but after a few months, she knew the right price for every service and had learned how to size people up. There were guys selling all-inclusive packages, work contract, sponsorship letter, high-tech passport, airport car, lodging. But you had to ask how such hayseeds could know so much and have so many good contacts. You had to find people who had already used them, and if you didn't find any, then forget it. One man tried to scare her, saying he would tell her family what she was doing if she did not go with him. But her family already knew and although they boo-hooed, were glad to get the money she sent, even if it was nothing like what she would be able to send from Europe. And all the while she danced whenever they let her, and the rest of the time hung out with punters. She was good at both and made good tips, and in the end she got the deal she wanted. That was where I was going to stop. There. There's more. <coughs> How much time have you used up?
We have <coughs> nine minutes left before Q and A. Ten minutes. Period. Do you want more? Shall we just talk now about? Do you want to just chat? Sure. Yeah. yeah. That's assuming that you have things to say or ask. Seems well, to I me like to a lot say, of it's amazing that you've written this. <laughs> really? Yes. I mean, taking, I really love to be able, I mean, you have all of this experience and, pers your, you know, the information that you've pulled together over, and, and then to put it in that format where you can be the person that is experiencing this. That's brilliant. It's just, oh, I'm like, you. awesome. You know, I started, I first had the idea to write this novel at the very beginning of doing this academic stuff, so I had no academic experience, and right early on, I thought, uh-oh, this is, yeah, this is, I could see without even, I could see how limiting and how terrible it was going to be, and I started writing, I, I mean, I have written fiction before in my life, and I started writing <clears throat> this other thing and then every once in a while maybe when I found the academic stuff to be too much or the theory or whatever then I would go back and I would write some more and in the first um, the first version of this the detective was in Miami um, and so they were Latin Americans who had come across the Mexican border or you know come on pateras from Puerto Rico or something but I kept, I just kept, I kept thinking about it. And then I had dropped it and then I thought, I'm, uh, I'm going to pick this up again. And it was really, it was really wonderful doing it, I have to say, it was really fun. Because this kind of thing, as you know, is extremely constricting, is that the right word? <laughs> yes, what do you have to say? I, I was struck um, in Three Headed Dog, and and, uh, I, and I think I noted in when I reviewed it was that it's a it's a not just a useful skill; it's a gift to be able to take a complex set of um, ideas and present them as a piece of fiction. Not everybody can accomplish mm -hmm. that. I read Pulp Fiction simply as an escape mechanism from all the other kind of reading I do. And there are certain ones that I like more than others. Um, but I have to admit that it's nice to, quietly embedded within a nice, a good story, a detective, a noir detective story, is something else, right, that tells you something. I think theater does, good theater does that too, right? may be fanciful, but it's telling, it's, you know, theater, you could say, it's a lie that tells the truth, right? So, um, but go can. What I was struck by, it because I had met people and I didn't know what to, to put my finger on why, um, what I was thinking about it, where people left dead-end jobs, dead-end situations, bad situations and went to some place that from my view, or maybe even object, I don't even know if you could say objectively, looked worse, and yet that that was positive, right? Because that was movement. Because a dead end place, no matter how beautiful, is dead end. And that's just not who we are as human beings, where we, we feel stifled, we want something more. And, um, discovered that even I had, in my lifetime, had put myself, put myself into a position that was clearly worse than I was coming out of, but it was better because it was just movement and there was a desire to, there was a kind of a sense of hope to that, right? So maybe it's worse right now, maybe it'll be worse, but it has the potential of being better, whereas where I am has no potential whatsoever. So, That's right. Yeah. That's right. And it's also... Uh, you know, there are millions of, li of little anecdotes. There are all these research projects from well-meaning kind of sociological research where they would go and talk to, <clears throat> I don't know, I mean, in Europe, the, all, all the, the fashion is to talk about the Nigerian women as the, in the most terrible situation and 
they've been bewitched by juju and there's endless stuff about it. And so there are people that go and try to ask them these rational questions. One of which was when you decided to do this, did you realize how dangerous it would be? And they said, we're doing this to get ahead and make money, not to have safe lives. Like what? Yeah, is it, I mean, <laughs> the, the idea of risk, so that you could almost write this whole story in terms of perceptions about risk, so that whereas in, like I live part-time in, in Nordic countries now, where the idea of security inside the state is primary, it's primary, to be comfortable and safe and to know that there won't be any, any, okay, so that seems like the most important thing, and the higher, it, in most of the world, taking risk is taking, it's like you do that as an automatic kind of thing. If you want to find, if you want something new to happen, you have to step off the curve. You have to do something different. So the, if the people, everyone doesn't leave, it's not true that they're all desperate and racing away. It's only some people, and those are the people who can assume the risk, yeah? Who can say, this is, I'm really bored here, and this isn't going anywhere, and I hate my husband, and so I, you know, I have to go somewhere else. You could tell the whole thing that way, couldn't you? There's this overused term that's this, I, used agency, this concept called agency. Mm -hmm. And we often talk, I remember the beginning of the discourse, we talked about the fact that women who engage in commercial sex trade probably not no one does it uh, willingly, and they don't have agency. And, um, and I would, and I always thought that that was simply wrong, because someone who has traveled hundreds, if not thousands, of miles and to, and wound up in a bad situation have an enormous amount of chutzpah. Yeah. Right. And so they they already they they've come fifteen hundred miles to get to the United States and find themselves in what I would say a terrible situation and it's they're in a they're not victims in the way that we want them to be. In fact they're amazingly courageous that they were that they actually got up and left wherever they were, which has to be there's some comfort even in, in you know, in, in bed of the devil you know, right? But willing to uproot and travel fifteen hundred miles not having truly a clue as to what the hell is going to happen to you. And for some people it's a good thing, and other people it's really bad, or at least I presume that it's bad. But I think that takes an enormous amount of courage, I know, well, and that's you know, ignored. That, that well, courage this has is been a huge thing, and I, you know, encountered enormous amounts of hostility from people who, I mean, very intelligent, um, kind of socialist soci sociologists, for instance. I remember this one rather well-known woman. Uh, in some English university that I was talking at, and she was very annoyed. She, she, she said to me, but you have to admit that objectively they are victims. You have to admit that. And I said, I can see why you, with your <laughs> values, and yeah, would produce them as victims. All I'm saying is that if you moved over to the side of the table and looked at it from their point of view, they don't perceive themselves to be victims. She was furious, furious, shouting at me, and I thought, I don't, yeah, this is, I don't know why, this seems to me common sense. I never <laughs> thought any of this was very, you know, like deep stuff. I thought this is, <laughs> I, I'm just saying out loud, it's really common sense. Obviously, you think it's horrible, but they don't, so that's that. They don't. Why would you this really? I realized over the years, oh, this is getting hilarious now, because I realize now that, yes, that you have to perform this kind of indignation, that the indignation about in, injustice, you were talking about Facebook, that you get these social justice where you just have to keep performing, this is horrible and that's horrible. And <laughs> as a, I, I, I suppose it was her identity. It didn't seem to me that it added very much to the conversation <laughs> about these migrations. Well, I think that that's with like, specifically with the people that you're talking about, like all these helpers who have that as such an integral part of who they are that 
if you say that they might want to do it, then mm -hmm. I'm not a person anymore. Like I'm useless. That's right. My help isn't needed and That's I right. can't, I'm yes. not in this conversation anymore. If they want to do it and it's okay, then yes. I'm screwed, you know? <laughs> like, well, of course, I remember. I know. Yeah. I've just spent all this money to get a degree if they don't need you. <laughs> I'm not a lot of money. Money. I'm trying to No, I remember a very, in the, in the, cause you, uh, when I started out doing this, I had no idea. They weren't using the word trafficking and I had no idea that I would encounter hostility, right? And so I got into situations that were unbelievable where I realized Everyone in this room wants to kill me now. <laughs> I've said something, and I wasn't even sure what is it that I've, what I've done. And one of the women, I remember this, she was a Finnish feminist academic, and she said, are you suggesting that we shouldn't do anything? That we shouldn't care about anyone? And so I had to evolve lots of ways of trying to make, no, you're, you have your life and you're going to do your life. I'm suggesting that you might listen more to what the people that you are going to engage with say. But people hear this in this drastic, yeah, it's drastic, you're saying that I have meaningless, that, yeah. That I could potentially be causing harm, and heaven forbid that I could be causing harm, when all I want to do is save people. Exactly, exactly, uh, yeah. I find that at this school as well, in some of the development very surprised when you say that there is a presumptuousness or kind of a colonial yeah. um, reminiscent, I guess, um, ingredient to that. Yeah. I think that people get really surprised and almost hurt that you're questioning them and their intent. And I found that to be an interesting aspect, mostly yeah. in um, privileged, more white, more, um, yeah, privileged, I think. Yeah, well, the entire, I mean, I my youth was spent in anti-imperialist activities, so I was <laughs> always angry about U.S. invasions of Latin America, and all. I mean, it was endless. I have to say that when I decided finally to go and read some books, <laughs> and I began to be able to place all this historically, and I, it helped. It helped a lot. But at the beginning. I was angry and completely confused, and the people, when I began <coughs> speaking in small situations, I didn't understand what everyone was so angry about, but I began, they were development conversations. It was a school of education, I was, uh, I had worked in NGO projects, and I, and so I thought this thing called development education, I was instantly furious at everybody. <laughs> <laughs> all of the professors, everyone, I was furious. And I was also their age. I was the same <laughs> age as the professor, so it was really, it, you know, it was very hard. So I had to e evolve over time. Yeah, I had to learn how to try to get some information across without provoking this stuff. So I wouldn't have expected to, unless, as you say, some of those partnership people came for people to be angry, but I do go into a lot of situations where I think, uh-oh, you know, there's some people that have come here to object. And so learning how to handle that, and try, instead of arguing, trying to point to Marina, who, <laughs> see, she's taking the bus because, I don't know, that's, that's how I've been able to handle it. How did you find yourself in these conversations? I mean, I feel like, it's almost a, unless you belong to a certain group, it's hard to get kind of that honest conversation out of people. You mean the migration? The migration. Just, yeah, I, I feel like with both you had, um, you know, with the with Three-Headed Dog, you have kind of this conglomeration of all of these experiences and all of these conversations that you've had. And even with sex in, in the margins, you've got just these quotes from people that if you're walking into a, a club and you start talking with someone, they're no. not going to open up. That's not... No, that's well, not you have standard, to realize obviously. that years are involved here, right? Right. So um, the first research that I did <clears throat> when I was in that school of education, I, I went to Madrid to observe what was going on with, in this public place, which, as I pointed out before, outdoor, outdoor sex industry stuff is what you can go to and look at. 
I perceive of all of these, uh, especially Latin American um, migrants, as being like me. I, that's my perception. That's my perception is that I'm like them, and so I talk to them on the same terms. If you want to know, did I ever sell sex? Yes. Not with any big identity, so I have never used that as a big thing. I am this, therefore, blah, blah, blah. But Felix, who is arguably, that's my character, in the first excerpt, she's remembering her youth when she went as around, kind of as a, well, she, uh, I mean, a different era, but wandering around Europe, working in informal situations, whatever came up, whatever came up. But that doesn't explain, so then we, if you do PhD research, so now it's years later and now you have to have field work. And so I lived in Spain for a couple of years and I was studying the rescue industry. That is to say, I hadn't named it that yet, but I was studying the helpers so that I did not want to study those poor women. I wanted to study those middle class people that are so sure that they know. So I was in thousands of situations, but also wherever I am in Spain, I'm with people that I think are like me. So I just talk to them. Have I ever been inside? Yes. So then, you know, you get, you, you have networks. I don't know how many of you do this kind of research, but so then you have these kind of snowball things where you find someone and he says, okay, so you can come and talk to me. So I talked to owners of clubs and went in and met people there, or I met, people who lodge migrants who, so part of the deal that they've got from the smuggler is that there will be a place for them to live in the town that they're going to try to get work in. So those are known. So these are, you know, flats that have multiple rooms and maybe 10 people in them. And so then I went and hung out there. It is absolutely true that sometimes people won't have anything to do with you. And I've been stood up, you know, on rainy street corners where I realized, no, she's never going to. Yeah, it's, I, you know, I have deep, I have deep doubts about what research is, but I signed on for it and so I did it. I was most comfortable when I was, <laughs> when I was studying the rescue industry or these, you know, middle class people and I would tell them what I was studying and they never believed me. <laughs> so they never perceived me as a threat at all. <laughs> They never believed that I would ever have anything to say about them. They assumed that I felt sorry about all the migrants. And so no matter how much I would, you know. <laughs> Reiterate. That was, pretty, that was pretty funny. So in Sex at the Margins, the field work is also handled in a dramatic fashion. I did vignettes to try to dramatize these ludicrous, insane situations that happen where a Japanese tourist tries to take pictures of an Nigerian escort on the street and you know street fighting come I've seen all the, the, all those things absolutely and much more and so some of it I think is just that I I believe like I spent yesterday wandering around downtown so my people were there all the homeless people those are the people that I identify with I can't explain this I guess I feel that I've escaped being one of them by a small very small margin so I've, I've lived illegally places, and I've, I've been in a lot of trouble in my life, <laughs> but I've escaped so far. And so that's when I got to the sort of civic center and I saw, I thought, oh, I see. Oh, here they are. Yeah, so I sort of sat on a bench and people came and talked to me. I don't know what it is. I don't know. Do any of you do this kind of research? where you have to make, find people? Not Snowball, yet. you have. You not have. yet. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> but you're planning to do it. Kind of. I mean, I want Is that work. part of the? It can be, but it's, you know, if folks are here two years and within that frame of time, right. especially since we have such strict IRB issues, yeah. getting the approval. And in this- That's in right, this that was tricky, that was right, tricky. This work, trying to get IRB approval, you know, uh, <laughs> is tough enough with adults. If you were to try to say, I think I want to go actually do research dealing with minors who are involved in commercial sex trade, they would they would just basically shoot you on site and just get it over with rather than putting you through the misery. Yeah, no, there are, there's stuff about the children, whoever brought that up, yeah, yeah. That, that's pretty hard. I mean, 
when I got in, there was a woman called Heather Montgomery who is still at the Open University who had written stuff that drove people mad because she'd done her research. She's an anthropologist and she had done her research in Asia and she was pointing, she said, you know, to, to call them all objects of pedophilia is to take away the very little margin for negotiation that they actually do have. They do have. So that even, I mean, I've done stuff with kids in Latin America in bus stations, kids in bus stations. So these are, you know, badly behaved kids. So they're trying to pick pockets and they're trying to, yeah. So, but supposedly they're all victims, actually, you know, they're little bastards, they're really, you know. <laughs> yeah, but so then I finally met someone who'd done a research project, again, it was, it was in Bangladesh, where one of these little boys, one of these terrible little boys had disappeared and everyone was worried he's been carried off, he's been, he's been trafficked, all of this stuff. And after a few weeks, he reappeared and they said, where have you picked it? And he said, oh, I went on holiday in Bali. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people, <laughs> so he's nine. It doesn't stop him from, from going on holiday, you know. I mean, so there, there have been, when I entered, I mean, it's very, just serendipity. When I started wondering about this, it was just the moment that it was changing. So there still were people, especially in anthropology, which is supposed to believe in cultural relativism and therefore it's okay for children to do things that they don't do in other countries. That would, there were still people talking about it. I don't know how easy it is now to have little events where people can meet and tell these funny stories about you know, naughty children. I don't know. But so then it, be, it only began to get repressive and terrible some years later. So I I got yelled at, but I was able to do what I wanted to do. But I wasn't trying to put under the microscope the poorest, most pathetic third world woman who could know. I was, you know, these were UN ladies. You know, I went to things where there were UN ladies that I would then ask questions of. Like, what do you think you're doing? I was very nice about it. And then, as I said, they never believed that I was going to criticize them. Mm-hmm. <laughs>